نحمده و نسلی و نسلم على رسوله الكریم و على آله الطیبین الطاہرین العارفین الى یوم الدین اما بعد My dear brothers, sisters, children, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. After a considerable period of time, we have reinstigated the Yarmi Sharif program. We were hoping to do one last month with the Muharram Sharif, but unfortunately we couldn't because there was still some deviant part of the pandemic. There's still some uncertainty, but anyway, now that the restrictions are being lifted, we will reinstigate the uh, monthly gathering restricted for those people who live in or around Hijaz. It's not really a public gathering, just for our own people who are in the immediate vicinity, because it is difficult to cater for large numbers with our facilities here. However, Alhamdulillah, I'm very pleased to see that we have reinstigated the mehfil with the remembrance of our, one of our very most beloved brothers, Sheikh Maulana Sufi Muhammad Munir Sahib, he passed away just a year ago and as my honorable brother was saying just a few moments ago that actually he was due to pass away about seven years ago given his health actually not even seven years ago I remember he suffered a major stroke and I went to Walsgrave Hospital to see him. And he was completely paralyzed on his left or right, I can't remember. And somebody who suffers major stroke, not a minor stroke, a major stroke, it is very difficult for them to retrieve their position and come back to health. I think this is probably about 12, 13 years ago this happened. And at that point, everybody said, well, he has diabetes, he has this, he's got all sorts of issues. And I remember visiting him and he was crying when I was visiting him. I asked him, why are you crying? He said, I'm not crying because I might die. I'm crying because I would like to teach more. I'm crying for my students. I'm crying for those who want to seek knowledge from me. And would you believe it, within three days, he was up and about as if nothing had happened to him. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala rewarded him for his good intentions because he didn't want to get up for his personal reasons or oh, I want to live more because I want to earn more money or I want to earn more fame no only purely he was worried about teaching his students and from that point I believe it was about 12 14 years ago from that point till last year, every so often 
he would dip in his health and every time I'd go and see him he would cry and he would tell me that I'm worried about wanting to teach more and do dua for me that Allah gives me a little bit more life so I can teach more. I found his attitude completely irrational. Irrational means has no material logic to it. There was no material logic, oh I want to do this for my children, I want to buy another house. You know people have aspirations, dunya aspirations. But all he was considerate about was the ability to teach the deen. And the truth of the matter is that since I've known Sufi Sahib Rahmatullah and that must be approximately, I'd say, 40 years? In the 40 years, that I knew him, the biggest quality I saw in Sufi Sahib was that he was always a very humble man. Always very humble. He was never delusional about his status, about his desires. He was always, from the beginning, Till the end, he's very, very humble. And actually, just, you know, I was, as I was writing all day today, and I was just looking at the condition of the great people. The man who is the greatest human being after the prophets and messengers without directly and indirectly and globally the man who's the greatest man after the prophets and messengers is Hazrat Sayyidina Abu Bakr Siddiq and when Hazrat Abu Bakr Siddiq I was Astounded that when he succeeded the throne of the Prophet ﷺ, the throne of Khilafat, the first speech he gave, the first thing he said, O oh people, know that Abu Bakr knows nothing. Abu Bakr knows nothing. And yet, he knew everything. Huh? The greatness sometimes of Hazrat Ali Karamallah Wajhaul Kareem is supported by the fact that when in the Kaaba, on the conquest of Mecca, Fatah of Mecca, Somebody was required to be elevated and they didn't have scaffolding. So they said, we need somebody to destroy these idols in the Kaaba. So, Prophet ﷺ, people said, Ya Rasulullah, why don't you use a stick to destroy the idols in the Kaaba? And why don't you stand on our shoulders and we will lift you and you destroy the, the idols in the Kaaba. Prophet ﷺ said, there is no one amongst you who can carry the burden of Nabuwat. So then, he said to Hazrat Ali, Karim, Ali, 
you stand on my shoulders and stand there and destroy the idols. Greatness of Hazrat Ali. He had the opportunity to stand on the shoulders of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But in Hijrat, when Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was traveling in Hijrat, there was one and two. Huh? One and two. Just two. Thani Asnain. Who is the Thani? Who is the Isnain? Huh? Actually, Thani means second. Ithnain means second. There was a second and there was a second. Huh? Like one day when, because the Prophet when he was ill, he would always ask Hazrat Abu Bakr Siddiq to lead the prayers. One day Hazrat Abu Bakr was leading the prayers, Prophet came out of his hujra. Hazrat Abu Bakr Siddiq realized that the Prophet's hujra door opened and he came to join the congregational prayer, Jamaat. Hazrat Abu Bakr during the prayer started to go backwards so Prophet can lead the prayer. Prophet put his hand on the back of Abu Bakr. Abu Bakr, stay and be the Imam of the Muslimin. And what did the Prophet do? Did he stand behind Abu Bakr and pray namaz? No. He stood on the Musallai Imamat and was an Imam with Abu Bakr. The second and the second. Huh? They were traveling together in Hijra. And just before they got to Ghari Thor, the cave of Thor, Prophet Sallallahu feet started to bleed. So Hazrat Abu Bakr said, Ya Rasulullah, your feet are bleeding. Shall I carry you? At that time, Prophet Sallallahu did not say, Abu Bakr, you cannot carry the burden of Nabuwat. Huh? Prophet ﷺ said, Okay, Abu Bakr, come, you can carry Muhammad Rasulullah. Huh? Hazrat Abu Bakr Siddiq, he carried the Prophet. ﷺ. The one in whom is the knowledge of the whole of the transuniversal existence. Abu Bakr carries him. Carries Nabuwat on his shoulders. And on his succession, he tells the Mu'mineen, the Muslimin, Abu Bakr knows. What does he know? Nothing. And that was the quality of these great people. You see, I, just the other day I was mentioning to our brothers, I think it was Dr. Jesus or somebody, I was sitting with them, and a non-Muslim who works with me, I asked him, I said, what is it that you have learned from me? What is it that sticks out most from the things of Islam that I've taught you? Do you know what he said to me? He said, well, I've learned a lot of things from you. But one thing that really stands out, every day I think about it. And when I have problems, whatever I go through, I just think about one thing. And that one thing answers everything. I said, oh, can you share it with me? <laughs> what did I teach you? That gives you, a non-Muslim, the answers to everything. He said, well, you taught me that the secret of knowing about everything is to know that you are nothing. 
The secret, you're all quiet. It's not that complicated. It's not that philosophical. The secret to knowing about everything that there is, is to know that you, your existence, is actually nothing. And when you can understand that, and you apply that in your life, you will understand and realize that as you are nothing, Allah is everything. And Hazrat Sam Ramtullah used to say something beautiful. In different words, he taught the same thing. He said, when you realize that you are nothing and Allah is everything, then at that point, Allah is the one that makes you to become something. Hmm? And until that point, when you realize that you are nothing, if you think you're something, you're not even nothing. You're actually delusional. You actually need psychiatric help. You need education. To understand the reality of our temporal existence. If we think about the origin of man, even you the man, it's shameful. It's from nothing to nothing to nothing. From you who was nothing before your parents were born and they came out of nothing and then they came out of nothing our evolution continues from nothing the matter from which we were created I won't go into the biology of it 50, 60 years ago was nothing and the matter through which our parents were created, 80, 90 years before that, was nothing as well. So the reality is that our existence is nothing and good people, great people, like Hazrat Sayyidina Abu Bakr Siddiq, you know, one day he was in his room and Hazrat Umar radiallahu ta'ala who came, knocked on the door, found no one home because it was his friend's home. So he just opened the door and found that Hazrat Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu ta'ala anhu was taking his tongue out and spiking his tongue with his fingers. You know, like this, spiking it. And restraining it. He said, Abu Bakr, what are you doing? He said, I am teaching my tongue not to speak about things which it doesn't know about. I find that my tongue starts speaking. Just the other day, yesterday, I happened to ask Fritz out to make a call to somebody to do a source of somebody. And I had a 40 minute conversation with that person. In those 40 minutes, I spoke for one minute and the other sp person spoke for 39 minutes. And you know, at the end of the call, he said, well, sorry, Sheikh, but people do say to me, my biggest weakness is I talk a lot. I said, really? Oh, surprising. 39 minutes I had to listen to his lecture. I only said one minute 
which included assalamu alaikum khudafiz may allah bless you i'm very sorry for the person who passed away that was about 40 seconds and then the other 20 seconds i can't remember because i think it was g g g g if you include all my g's that amounts to one minute 39 minutes person spoke and i was like subhanallah huh? unbelievable how much we talk Yet Hazrat Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he was training his tongue, restraining his tongue to say to the tongue, tongue, you speak too much. Don't speak unless you know. And that's how great people taught. And honestly, I have never seen and that's the one good thing about Sufi Sam. One thing is, I never ever saw him have a chit chat, gossip, idle chat, social chat. You know, people phone each other, ki aale, tiko, bache tikne, sab tikne, you know, idle chit chat. Okay, why did you phone? No, no, just to find out. He never ever and it doesn't mean he was very clinical he's very business-like no he was very polite he was very nice he had a lot of respect but he never had the idea that I'm going to have a social life do you know what his social life was one day I said to him I said he said Oh, he came to me and he was very upset, teary. I said, what's the matter, Zuvi son? He said, you know, I need more vazifas. I need more zikr. I said, okay. So, you know, over a period of time, I'd given him a lot of zikr to do. And even the zikr I'd given him, I'd forgotten. So I said, let's write down the zikr you are doing. So I wrote down all the zikr. I said, Sufi Sahib, this should take you about three hours. He said, yeah, that's right, it's not enough. He said, oh, I said, why do you want more? He said, well, because, you know, I don't want to do anything else. I just want to spend all of my time doing zikrullah. That's quite different to what normally people call me up for. You know, when some murids call me, said, uh, excuse me, I said, gee, I know what it's about. You know that zikr you gave me? Yes. Can you half it, please? Can I quarter it? I don't have time. And they're always looking for reduction. You know, like women are looking for discounts in the sale. The murids are always looking for a reduction in the zikr. <coughs> always. But there are few people that I've met in my life, few people in our silsila. I won't mention names, but honestly, not more than these fingers that I, I'm holding up. In all of the thousands of murids in our silsila, I can't remember more than these number of fingers, 10 people who have come to me and said, can I have more and more and more zikr? Out of those 10, Sufi Sahib was one of them. Hmm? So, Alhamdulillah, what does that teach you about the life of Sufi Sahib Ramatullah the life of great people and I'm not saying Sufi Sahib had no faults because only Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was perfect he had no faults but actually in the 40 years that I saw him, honestly, I can't remember anything that I can say was a fault. 
That's lightly said. But Alhamdulillah, he was a very, very nice individual who we sorely miss today. So I think that the most important lesson for us today, and I think it's also important for you all today because we're just about on the verge of launching our global initiative. People from all over the world will travel to Hijaz to see what is Hijaz all about? What is the vision of Hijaz all about? And one of the things that we should remember is not to do anything which is self-projection. Projecting yourself. The only thing we should be doing is to project Allah, Rasulullah, Islam. That's it. Even in the heyday of Islam, great people only projected Allah, Rasulullah, and Islam. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, give us the tawfiq, the opportunity to truly become humble people. No money makes you great. No status makes you great. No fame makes you great. Only if you are close to Allah makes you great. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give, give us all the opportunity to become true slaves of Allah Almighty. And for our children as well, that they become true slaves of Allah. It doesn't matter if we're doing this work, sophisticated level work, or we're just brushing the masjid. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what you do, where you sit, however sophisticated you're doing. Whatever you're doing, your closeness with Allah is only determined by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That stroke of the brush, that one brush, may be the one that's accepted by him. And somebody who spent 10 million pounds, his expenditure of that 10 million pounds may be rejected by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we must all remain humble in front of the greatness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us to become good human beings and to become good Muslims. I could not uh, start the Zikr Sharif without saying a few words about my beloved, um, you know, uh, my relationship with Sufi Sam. I should say one last thing about this. What was my relationship with him? I would say, first and foremost, he was an excellent friend. His friendship with me over 40 years did not ever, ever change. It remained constant. A great friend, a great brother, a great murid, a great khalifa, a great teacher, a great student. All of those things that I feel are those things that connected me and him I think were great things. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala elevate him in his qabr. Let's finish off with the uh, zikr sharif and then we will close with the dua.